Hey everybody, this is Greg Pettix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Pettixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to continue our coverage of every single issue of Epic Illustrated Magazine. And we're up to the third issue, Fall 1980. Uh, it's got a nice cover by Paul Galassi. Uh Just kind of sci-fi-ish. Uh, kind of just uh, one color. Well, there's a few colors, but it's very uh, orangey yellow. Uh, must have popped out at the stands. Very interesting uh, color palette for this. The third issue here, things are getting better. Epic's uh, reaching its stride. I just uh, flipped through this before this uh, recording this video. And I got to say, this issue's uh, definitely better than the first two. There's some really good stuff in here. Once again, we have Archie Goodwin's overview. Uh, writes uh, nice little backup stuff about all the stories. Gives you some information about the artists. And uh, so uh, we're starting something big here. Uh, adaptation of Elric. Uh, Michael Moorcock's famous fantasy character. Script by Roy Thomas. Art by P. Craig Russell. So this is uh, some beautiful P. Craig Russell stuff. Unfortunately the, unfortunately, the colors are still a little weird. I think maybe that's how P. Craig Russell likes it. It looks like here we have like marker color and it's kind of, you know, not, I don't know, washing out. It's it's not the uh, best coloring, but as far as the palette and the choices, it's beautiful. It's just the actual production of the coloring sometimes leaves a little bit to be desired. How it's splotchy here, there's some splotchiness, but just this first page, some gorgeous P. Craig Russell, crazy design work. And uh, so basically this is, uh, I think this is only going to be excerpts. They're going to do uh, this chapter, another chapter, and then they're going to finish it in the Elric graphic novel. So it's kind of a tease. Um, that's kind of annoying to me. So basically in this fantasy world, there's these sea lords. They're kind of like ups from the upstart kingdoms. They're all plotting to take down Melnibony, which is like the decadent powerful city that's been running the world forever and they're tired of it but to do this they need the help of Elric who they're waiting for him to show up he's late and some guys are saying oh maybe he's betraying us and but Elric shows up and even though he's from Melnibony he's helping them because well we'll find out in a second so he's just a he's a weird guy he's white as a ghost he's got red eyeballs uh, Red pupils. He's uh, just a, a weird dude. And we find out why his evil cousin, Ayrkun, Wirekun, usurped his throne and even stole his love. And um, that's his cousin. Wirekun, you know, basically is like forcing his cousin to be his queen. And Elric, you know, wants to get revenge basically and uh we see Melnibony it's just this uh, decadent city that's kind of on the wane it's still powerful but uh you know it's seen better days as far as spiritually I guess you could say and morally so uh Elric does the spell to cover their ships until they're ready to attack he makes this mist and it totally weakens them this is some beautiful art here he just passes out on the floor. So we basically establish that Elric, uh, you know, he's not as strong as the old wizard kings. He uh, he depletes his energy every time he does these crazy spells. And then he tells the guys, though, I have to go to my liberty before the attack. I have some things to arrange and people to see. So he makes this spell to make the winds blow really hard so he can get there, like, in really quick, less than a day or something. Yeah, just Craig Russell drawing these uh, crazy spells and the magic stuff. Some beautiful stuff. These waves. I like this a lot. I love P. Craig Russell. So then we get to Metamorphosis Odyssey, Chapter 5. We finally meet. Uh, we're about to meet Vanth, who will go on to be known as Vanth Dreadstar. Uh, a long-running comic series, Dreadstar was. So, um, what's his face? Uh, 
McNaughton is, you know, he's rounded up his uh, little posse, but now he needs a protector for them. So he goes to this cold planet by Frexia, and he's like, gets in a little scuffle with this guy because he thinks he's one of the evil Zygodians, the, the race that um, McNaughton's trying to take down. He says, hey, do you know about this Vanth guy or this warrior? And he says, oh, I know that guy. He's got this magic sword. He's he's really, you know, he's a freedom fighter against uh, the Zygodians. But then he, I guess he doesn't trust him. And he goes to, uh, he's going to stab him. But he hits him with a mind control ray, a hypnoblast. And while they're walking, he tells them the origin of Vanth. And Vanth uh, grew up on the planet. And uh, he was a... Uh, his parents were killed by these snow bears. So he kind of went crazy and went out to the wilds. He took refuge in a holy place. And every now and then people could see him like naked you know, on this really cold planet. He's really lost his mind. So then he, uh, one day he comes into town, buys all this hunting gear. And almost like Batman with his parents, he, he's trying to kill every snow bear. He almost decimates the entire population. People on this planet aren't too happy with this because they live off the, the snow bears. That's their main food source. So they try to hunt him down. And uh, so Dreadstar takes off. He's just like, see you later. But then the Zygodians attack and Dren uh, Vanth returns. And Vanth leads the people in a fight against them. And he's like, kick ass. He's like, he's like as strong as 20 men. He's got the sword. He basically sets back the Zygodian invasion by months, single-handedly. So then this guy gets shot because it's the these guys are working for the Zygodians. They're a mercenary. It's they're called the A Team. Um, I don't see B. A. Baracus there, but there's some <laughs> like that cute little rabbit guy. He looks pretty formidable, but he's still kind of cute and fuzzy. So they attack, and then all of a sudden Vance shows up. Because uh, Agnaton's not nearly strong enough to fight all these guys. He's not that good at hand-to-hand -hand combat. Once again, it continues later on in the issue. Let's jump ahead. And here's chapter 6 of the Metamorphosis Odyssey by Jim Starlin, I should say. I forgot to mention that. So Vanth quickly takes all these guys out. This is some nice painted art. You know, for Jim Starlin. And, uh... Yeah, just some good action. He's kicking ass, all these random mercenaries. Finally, a sword pops out because he's in a jam. It just appears out of nowhere. And uh, that's a nice panel, him deflecting these laser bolts. And with the sword in his hand, he just makes mincemeat at him. So, Ignatan says, oh, I'm glad that that uh, sword I left found a good owner. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, I came here centuries ago and left that sword for someone. Because that's what he did. He went around the universe kind of seeding things for this day. So he tells Vanth the, the whole thing. He says, I'm going to need a protector for these guys. You want to join me? And uh, he says, together, we can uh, take down the Zygodians. And then uh, that's the end for this, this issue. Then we go back. We got another little short story. It's written by Archie Goodwin. To be honest, I didn't want to reread it. I was uh, not into it. But I'm pretty sure it's okay because Archie Goodwin was a good writer. Uh, this is uh, the same guy from the first issue, George Bush. Uh, he was a fantasy painter, but also, I guess I read in the beginning, he was more known for his cowboy cover art. He did lots of cowboy paperback covers. Not that great. Just kind of, I mean, obviously skillful. This guy can draw and paint, but kind of boring. Now, this is nice. It's getting the band back together. Doug Munch and Paul Galisi, the um, masterminds behind that brilliant run of at, on Master of Kung Fu in the mid-70s. And they've, of course, worked many times since. But this might might have been one of the most recent, um, their team-ups since Master of Kung Fu ended. I think they did some stuff for Warren together and stuff here and there. This is a nice, like, sci-fi comic, very... Um, 1984 dystopia, Brave New World type thing. This woman's getting interrogated for 
basically having antisocial behavior. And in this arbitration or this interrogation, it's like a psychological evaluation. They said, what would you be doing today if you weren't here? And she's just like, I'd be running free in nature where no one owned me. There'd be no machines. And they're saying incorrect. That's a antisocial thinking. You, you'd be neglecting your service, basically, the, you know, your job. So then she says, okay, now imagine if you're, you'd inevitably, inevitably be discovered for this transgression, and then the guards will show up, the robo cops will show up. What would you do then? And she says, I'd bravely fight them uh, with the fero ferocity of a proud animal, and then I'd run free, and then I'd go, and they, of course, correct her. So you wouldn't do that. Okay, let's say that does happen. Where would you go? I would go to my my um, my sexual congress partner, and she corrects herself. No, I would go to my lover, and I would like tell him of my newfound awareness, and he would join me, and we would, you know, escape society's horrible constrictions. Then we'd come back to the city and sing our knowledge from the rooftops, and everyone would join us, and people would reject this horrible system we have of course they're like no I'm incorrect let's actually show you a videotape of what actually happened when you stepped out of line so she's out of line she steps out of line because she sees her sexual congress partner janice in another line and he's just like get away he doesn't want to rock the boat he's not like her you know he's been regimented uh, to be like a human robot and, you know, and, and she sadly realizes, yeah, I didn't fight like a proud animal. I was taken. And they basically tell her that, you know, that was a small transgression, but from seeing your brain today, you're dangerous to society. You're very nonconformist. And so they electrocute her in her chair. Yeah, and I, I hope you've been noticing just how this is some great Paul Colese art, just how photorealistic it is. This is some nice stuff. I haven't even commented on the art. This beautiful black and white Paul Galassi. They're carrying our way. It turns out one of the guys in the room is Janice. And he doesn't shed a tear. He's not sad at all. He just says, oh, by the way, uh, could I uh, get permission to file for a new sexual congress partner? And he's like, oh, yeah, do it when the day's work is done. Permission noted. Thank you, Arbiter. And then it's next. So these are other nonconformists about to get their... Uh, to get fucked with. Uh, here's the letter page. Chapter two of Almeric, uh, adapted by Roy Thomas, script and Tim Conrad art. Uh, here's some more examples of Al. Uh, sorry, Tim Conrad. He's a pretty good artist sometimes, but sometimes he's a little weird. Just weird faces, and uh, so Almeric has kind of been accepted into the society. But first, he has to do this gladiatorial combat with one of their great warriors. And it's, it's like a fight that lasts for hours. They're so evenly matched. They're both at the point of exhaustion and Almeric wins. So that means everyone's kosher with them. They're like, you've proven yourself to be a great warrior. Even though you claim you're from another world, which we don't believe you, you're still a great warrior. You're worthy to live here as one of us. So he's totally accepted. Uh, they give him his, a new name, Iron Hand. That's his, like, hero name, I guess. It's a really nice page. And over the next few weeks and months, he uh, totally fits in. Nobody treats him shitty. He says it's this great life for him. Because like I said in the last uh, episode about Almark, he was a guy born out of his own epic. He was almost like a caveman. He didn't really get the modern world. So this is like, he spends all of his days you know, hunting and exploring and getting into like drunken brawls and hanging out at the tavern and uh, just having fun. And that's all he needs. And he says, basically, uh, he has no need of art or literature or intellectuality. To him, you know, that's nonsense. He just wants to live with gusto. So he's, he's digging it. He's liking this new world. But in all of his fun and excitement, he did, does forget that woman, Alpha, the one who, uh, you know, has been running into him every now and then, like in the first chapter. So one day he's out hunting pretty far from the city, 
and Alpha's escaping from this horrible, scary looking giant bird. And he rescues her. But she's being kind of weird and I was like, yeah, I thought you'd be grateful. I just saved your life. But she's like, you know, I don't fit in here in Almark in this world. She's almost like the opposite of him. I think she's like too sensitive for this world. She doesn't like a world where everyone's just fighting all the time and, you know, kind of being lunk-headed. So right then they get attacked by uh, these wing guys. They're from another city. And, uh, yeah, that's some kind of two-page spread. That's definitely a uh, 12-year-old Greg was uh, getting excited seeing that. And then it continues... Another continuing story, page 91. And so this fun action scene, he's fighting off these wing guys, but they get Alpha and um, they carry her away. So he goes, he gets one of the guys and basically just says, Let me, I'm going to get on your back and fly you there. I'm going to stab you in the neck, you know, if you, uh, if you do anything funny. But uh, his attention wanes for a second and the guy throws him off his back and he flies off. So then he comes to this other city and it kind of seems abandoned. And he's walking through some really nice moody art here as he's uh, traversing through the city. And then he finds Alpha. But the, these dog creatures have got them. He calls them dog heads. And he quickly uh, dispatches them. Beats the shit out of them. Chops off their, some of their heads. But then they're attacked by this giant fucking, I don't know, caterpillar creature. And all the dog heads run away. They're scared. And, but, uh, what's his face? Uh, Iron Hand. He, uh, just throws a giant rock on him and crushes him. And, uh, then they hit off until next chapter. So let's pop back here. This guy's really interesting. Terry, Terry Lindell. Archie Goodwin, who wrote the story, even says in the editorial that like, uh, yeah, I have a feeling a lot of you guys won't like this art because you want everything to look realistic. This guy's very impressionistic, just weird art style, especially for fantasy. He did paperback covers. He even did covers for Heavy Metal and interiors for Heavy Metal magazine. But it's this very strange uh, drawing, painting style. It's kind of a nice little sci-fi parable. There's a city that just waits. I guess everyone's dead. Once great lines of workers, you know, streamed in through my massive gates. Now no one comes. Every now and then, you know, so it looks like man has reverted to like cavemen, being cavemen. So every now and then, one of them will like run into the city and the, the city basically feeds him and clothes him and teaches him how to, you know, take care of the city. So he resets dials and levers and the city lives again. It hums with life. So he lives there for years and years and uh, the city serves him as long as he serves the city. And he doesn't even remember his past life. He's been there for so long. But then eventually he just gets absorbed into the city. And, uh, there's no longer a worker, only the city. And then it starts all over again. The city waits for another guy to come. This is an interesting article, especially considering it's time, because uh, Dungeons and Dragons was pretty new at that point, relatively new. And uh, this is an article about um, role-playing games. And uh, they interview Gary Gygax in here, which is kind of neat. But uh, even better than that, though, more interesting, they get Michael Golden to illustrate it. Just these beautiful Michael Golden illustrations. Uh, kind of in Michael Golden's prime. And uh, you got this, these two well-drawn little guys. And then they progress. This guy becomes more barbaric. This guy becomes more sci-fi, cyber-ish. And then they're blasting each other away. So some nice stuff. Just for the golden art. But I remember as a kid thinking that was interesting. I never heard, you know, I don't even think I knew about Dungeons and Dragons then. I was like, oh, this sounds weird. So there's the continuation of that short story. We already saw this Dread Star. And now we have Robert Wakelin shows up again. The guy who was in the last issue. And uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream 
kind of looks like a fantasy story at first, but it's science fiction. Once again, you can, as you can imagine, twelve-year-old Greg Pettis liked this comic a lot. Um, Robert Wicklund basically just drew cheesecake every panel. I mean, this stuff I could use in my work as a twelve-year-old when I couldn't get my hands on porn. This will do. This will. This will do. So, um, you know, very photorealistic, painterly style. It's all airbrush over pencils. And uh, it's kind of a silly little story. She's not, she's homesick. She's been stationed on this faraway planet on the outer rim. And it's like a relay station. And uh, she's just really bummed because she's homesick. But then one of the natives finds her. And it turns out it's our world. It's like some frontiersman. And he sees her in her dress. Turns into her wings and she flies away. But he does see her, which is a big no-no to the place where she, people she works for. So they actually station her even farther from home as a punishment. So it's kind of dumb. This story I fucking love. I still love this story. It's Paul Kirshner, the great cartoonist who, uh, you know, he was an assistant to Wally Wood. He did comics for High Times and Heavy Metal. He did The Bus, that continuing half-page strip in Heavy Metal. Just did a lot of various stuff. But he just draws very straight, but the things he depict aren't, which is a nice contrast. He, he has this very clean, almost like he could have worked in advertising in the 40s or 50s, you know. So it's this guy, and he's just talking about, in his head, he's telling us that he lives in this room. It's not easy to live as I do. It re requires diligence, concentration, and above all, control. Everything is perfectly set up, not to distract him. Um, the paintings are per, uh, t tasteful, demure. They're um, not uh, crazy abstract paintings that are going to make his thoughts wander. Everything is just set up for this. Every day he gets his, you know, tea time delivered at the same time. No uh, disruptions. And uh, he's pouring himself tea and he spills the teacup. And just that little consternation, that little distraction. This monster rises out of the tea. That's a really scary fucking monster. And he, he pulls his hands to his temples and concentrates and concentrates. And the monster goes away. And he ends by saying, it is not easy to live as I do. So this poor fucker, he's got to live like this every day of his life. He can't lose control. He can't be distracted. Or this will happen. He's, he's got some kind of psychic powers. This story is a really good sci-fi story. It's Bruce Jones, great writer, uh, started in the undergrounds, uh, did Twisted Tales and Alien Worlds for Eclipse. He worked for Marvel, too, you know. He, but his uh, short story stuff in all his anthologies, he's one of comics great writers, I think. <clears throat> Especially back then. He was head and shoulders above anyone in the 70s. The stuff he did for undergrounds. But this is, uh, there's this little robot uh, in space who's, building a wall he's been doing it forever and we hear his first person person uh you know narration and he says i build the wall i have always built the wall i am not well he keeps saying how he's not well he can't help but have sympathy for this poor little robot he's kind of got a personality um he's doing this job you know he's got to build this wall he's, and, uh, he's been doing it forever these spaceships pop out of nowhere and he just starts attacking them. He's like, oh, they, they must be the enemy stopping me and my mission. Because uh, I guess he's up there because there's this great war, you know, and um, he's doing some mission for it. But fine, he gets these transmissions from Earth where they're like, please, please do copy. You are to, you are to, to return to Earth immediately. The war is over. You, you don't have to do your mission anymore. It's, you know, it's... Please come back. And uh, you're firing on friendly forces. You keep firing on us. There's no need to complete construction. The war's over. Return to base. And he thinks it's a trick of the enemy. And um, he says, I have my orders. I am not well, but I have my orders. Complete the wall at any cost. So he keeps building the wall. Then more ships come to get him, like a whole fleet. And they're trying to stop him, finally. He destroys them. And then, it's kind of weird that he has this much power. 
but he somehow sets off the a lot of nuclear stockpiles on Earth. He beams his transmission, and they say, turn it off, for God's sakes, turn it off. You're the whole, and the whole world explodes. He blows up the whole world so he can get back to his work. Now I can work. I can complete the task without interruption. The enemy is destroyed. And here's the ironic last page. We pull back and we see that Wally's building was just this giant thing that says peace. Kind of corny, very 70s, even though this is 1980, but that's such a like 70s underground comic thing. And uh, yeah, and oh, I didn't even mention the artist by Mike Cyan's, who did uh, a lot of stuff we'll see in Epic in the future. And uh, just, just really photorealistic kind of good sci-fi art. Lots of airbrush. And we already saw this already. And the letter page continues on the inside. Well, not the inside back cover, but this last page. So that's it. Epic Illustrated. Third issue, Fall 1980. Uh, shit, I really think these are uh, on an upward spiral. I can't wait to show off the next one and uh, flip through it again. I'll probably do that in a, you know pretty soon. Uh, I'm kind of staggering these, but uh, uh, I'm really enjoying looking at these again. These were very instrumental in my uh, childhood. And I hope you like them too. Uh, okay, I guess that's it. I'm signing off. Bye.